Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ontario Convention Center. And again, apologies for the late start. There were some serious traffic issues on the 15th. But we're going to get going. And uh, I'm going to tell you that you've made a great choice by being here this morning. We've got a wonderful program with some very wonderful people. Uh, and before we begin, everything that we're able to do as a section is so significantly enhanced by those who sponsor uh, and serve as our patrons. And I'd like uh, Mr. Tom Addis, our Executive Director and CEO, to come forward and introduce some of the sponsors who've made today possible. Please, Tom. Good morning, everyone. And thanks so much for being here. And uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, a couple of our sponsors. And as Jeff mentioned, uh, we could not do any of the programs that we do if it weren't for uh, the support of our partners and our sponsors, and that's whether it's tournament activities, uh, whether it's junior golf activities, foundation activities, or uh, education activities such as um, Gibbs this morning. And uh, although over the past few years we've suffered through some very, very difficult times, and things seem to be starting to trend a little bit in the right direction as far as our business, uh, we've had a number of, of our partners and our sponsors who, uh, I'm going to use the words, have stuck with us uh, through these thin times, and we really appreciate that, and uh, they're here this morning with us. And we'd like to invite a couple of them up to say a, a few words, very few words, and uh, for a couple of minutes each, and we appreciate that. We're going to start with uh, one of our newer sponsors who's been with us a couple of years now, and uh, with U.S. Foods. And they've been a great partner. And Mark Mejia from U.S. Foods is going to say a few words. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, and uh, thank you. Uh, we appreciate the partnership for the last two years. Uh, it's been great for us. Met a lot of great people and, and have helped some clubs grow their business. Uh, we are here as business partners. We want to make sure that you understand that uh, food and beverage is a profit center. There's ways to make money. I was uh, having a conversation just a few minutes ago. I've uh, been in the industry for about 20 years working as a food and beverage manager. And now I have the opportunity to work for U.S. Food Service as their golf course specialist. And uh, the really neat thing about it is it can be profitable, it can support your club. And uh, I'll be here all day to work uh, to answer any questions you might have regarding food and beverage and U.S. Foods. Thank you. Mark, we have a little plaque for you, too, that I'll deliver to you. That's, thank you for being quick. That's as quick as I've ever <laughs> seen Mark Mejia. Uh, and if any of you work with Mark, you know. Thank you very much. Now, we're good friends. I have to say that, too. Uh, next, we have one of our longtime sponsors uh, with GPS and Visage, uh, Club Car, uh, Eric Andrews. And we appreciate everything that uh, Club Car has done, whether it be our, our professional official, uh, or our section championship and other activities. So, Eric? Uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks, PGA Southern California. I just want to take a couple seconds to, I guess, reintroduce our Southern Cal team. Uh, David Herzog, who covers our LA um, and up north, the coast, uh, he's not here with us today, but Travis Jackson is here. Travis, if you can stand up. Um, Travis covers the San Diego market, uh, uh, Orange County, Riverside. And I'd like to invite uh, Jim up to say a couple words. Jim Hoppenrath is our technology partner with uh, Club Car Visage. And uh, just talk a little bit about where we're going. There's been a lot of questions of what this is and uh, where Club Car is going. So Jim, if you say just a few words. I'll thank you. keep it really short. No, uh, so thank you all for the opportunity here. Um, I was asked, uh, talked about technology, uh, and specific, I won't talk specifically about Visage technology, but just technology and golf as, um, as in that relationship. First off, it's here, and it's here to stay. Um, the three things that I'll just uh, touch on are um, what we call a connected car. Uh, what does that mean? Um, literally, the technology exists today to get all the diagnostics of that electric vehicle and in a, in a a cloud-based way. In other words, you get in real time on an internet 
actually see energy usage, traffic patterns, pace of play, all kinds of information that uh, can be viewed and utilized to your benefit. Talk about the smart car. Uh, what does that mean? It literally means that at any point on the earth, on your property, you can control that vehicle, okay? How fast it goes, does a message come up? Um, literally a game changer in our industry, I believe, because um, I mean, we literally can save lives with this. I mean, uh, real world uh, application down in Southern California, there's someone who died. I'm sure you know, we've all heard stories about that. So if we can prevent that um, through this technology, um, obviously that's a game changer in our industry. Um, and then lastly, I'll just talk about um, the enhanced car. And really what I'm referring to is the interaction. So now we're talking about touch screens. We're talking about kind of more iPod um, interaction. Um, again, enhancing the, the benefit, food and beverage, uh, to have a better experience, get more food and beverage, more revenue. Um, so today, really just trying to get you to think and embrace technology. We'll, we, we'll be here. I'm happy to talk about your specific operation. But again, technology here, let's embrace it and let's make money from it. Thanks. Thank you, Jim and Eric, very, very much. And again, we encourage you to, whether it be on a break or at lunch, uh, outside of our speakers, of course, that please go visit our sponsors and our partners out uh, outside in the foyer uh, and in the future. And when they do call, uh, we would love it if, if you would take their call and, and invite them into your businesses, into your golf shops, uh, and spend some time with, uh, with uh, our sponsors. We'd appreciate that. Next up is Sky Golf, and uh, one of your uh, most familiar faces, at least to, to most of you out there, uh, former tournament director uh, with the Southern California PGA, and uh, we just can't seem to get rid of them. <laughs> As if we want to, right? Anyway, uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Gerald Wong up to the podium, please. Gerald. Oh, I can't wait to grill him one day. Reminds me back in 2010 in August, and then I sat in the office and before the second championship, and I said, Tom, I'm going to made the decision to go with Cleveland Golf and Strix on and be a sales representative. And he sat there and looked at me square in the eye and said, you know what, Gerald, good luck. You're actually going to be worth a lot more, uh, worth more to us now than you were the last <laughs> nine years. I didn't know how to take it back then as a compliment. I took it as a compliment, of course, because, uh, you know, but uh, it's great seeing you all here. And uh, not to confuse anything, but I wanted to introduce a couple of other of the local reps in Southern California because we're all with Cleveland Golf and Strings on. And in February, uh, we had the structural changes within uh, that company, which allowed us to become independent sales representatives. So, uh, joining me along on the Sky Golf journey is Jim McDonald, which handles he handles the Desert Chapter uh, Inland Empire, uh, and then Tim Shuck, who is Orange County in San Diego. And then my accounts are in Los Angeles, uh, up to Hunter Ranch, believe it or not. So it's uh, some good driving. But um, before we even did some research to be taken on this line, we uh, we all got together and talked to some of our pros that we had built friendships with about the the company and the product line, and yeah, a couple things to say. Um, yeah, the subscription. Our members really don't like that too much. Um, innovation. The Kind of slow down a little bit on on the production of the units um, you know just the waiting of 15 minutes on the phone to get help that kind of hurts too so we all kind of looked at each other and says how do we sign up for this fantastic so we took it on and we took it on because a lot of these questions have been answered they have a hotline for the pros now uh, they significantly lowered their annual subscription <laughs> rates Innovation, they have the new watch, which is the most accurate device out there for yardages. And, and also, it's multifunctional. You can keep track of your calories while you run. Um, the Sky Pro, which is a unit that has nothing to do with yardages, is to help you as instructors, help your students improve their golf game. You can download the Sky Pro app uh, onto your iPad, onto your mobile device, and basically 
improve your golf swing. It tracks club head speed to plane <laughs> to angles, and it's it's innovative and the talk of the PGA show this year. So that going forward, we're really looking forward to showing you all um, what Sky Golf is going to be in the future, and looking forward to working with you with uh, all the lines that we're going to carry around. Have a great day today, and um, if you need anything, we'll be out in the hallway. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerald. I miss you. <laughs> I'm done choking. Um, our final speaker with our partners today uh, comes from uh, Atlas Van Lines and would like to say that uh, they've provided. Uh, great information to us and great support to us. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Joe Tucker. Joe? Technology's here. I'm still waiting for that uh, car to come out that will just kind of get that thing and swing it for me because I can't hit the ball worth crap. So once you do that, I'm happy. Um, thank you for uh, having us out here at Atlas Van Lines. Most of you don't know, we are, we have a preferral agreement with the PGA. So it's preferred pricing. So ex moving is expensive. The average person probably moves about six times out of their life, in their lifetime, I should say. So keep that in mind. You are going to need to move every once in a while. Your friends are going to need to move every once in a while. I've got uh, pamphlets out there, I've got business cards, we're happy to be here, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks again to all of our sponsors, and uh, thanks again to all of you for being here this morning. One of the exciting and, and aggressive programs your section has launched this year is uh, a program we call Opportunities to be Smarter. And we're lucky to have a very strong committee structure within our section, uh, committed to education and helping us grow as professionals. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce the uh, czar of education, Mr. Tom Wilson, to introduce our first program of the morning. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, you're in for a treat today. We're going to uh, cover three different segments of the golf business, and uh, we're going to talk about the, the actual business of golf. We're going to talk a little bit about teaching, and hopefully you can add some of the things to your arsenal when it comes to teaching students. And then we're going to talk about marketing, how to market your facilities, how to uh, uh, retain members, to recruit new members, things like that. So it's, it's going to be a great treat. We've got three great... Uh, areas that we're going to cover, and the presenters are terrific, too, as you will see. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we get going. If you need to use the restroom, you don't need to raise your hand. You just go out the back door down to your left there. And then uh, I did hear a couple of cell phones go off, so please silence your cell phones, if you would, please, at this time. So to start off our uh, seminars today, uh, we're going to have John McNair. Uh, John. Uh, He's been in the business for nearly two decades uh, in the industry. He uh, manages all aspects of JC Resorts, uh, eight golf courses. In addition to overseeing the golf course operations, including golf course maintenance, food and beverage venues, and golf retail, he's also responsible for developing new golf course management contract opportunities. Uh, John has been instrumental in outlining the strategic sales and marketing goals for JC Golf properties and also uh, broad expertise in creating and implementing uh, membership programs as well. Uh, John is a regular contributor to various golf publications, including the PGA Magazine and Golf Inc. And John also serves on the Southern California Board of Directors and uh, also many committees uh, and serving as chairman of the Communications Committee. So let's give a nice little welcome to John McNair. John. <laughs> Okay, perfect. 
Well, uh, today as we go through our presentation, uh, please don't forget to stop me at any point in time and ask a question. I've always felt that these uh, type of seminars that works best when it's two-way communication rather than just one way. Um, I'm going to cover three areas today. Uh, the first area is going to be uh, accounting and finance. The second one's going to be food and beverage. And the third one's going to be sales and marketing. Um, we start with sales, uh, finance and accounting because I know it's early in the morning. I don't want anybody to fall asleep later in the presentation. So. <laughs> Uh, budgeting. Could I first see a hands, uh, number of hands? How many people create a budget on an annual basis out there? Great. More than half the room. That's fantastic. When we create our budgets, uh, the first thing we always start with is we look at recent trends, where we were prior year and last year's results. The next thing we look at is what our ownership goals are. And this is actually, a lot of times, most important to us. For example, uh, we manage a couple city courses, and what the budget is, what they're looking at, is most important to them. Opposed to our ownership group, a lot of times they create budgets for uh, a bank more than something of an operating tool. And uh, they look more at last year, prior year, than they do on the budget. So I think it's important to note that. Um, the next thing to look at is uh, making sure you have a lot enough time to create your budget. Um, we try to do it at least, start at least a month in advance from when the budget is actually due. Um, then shifting over to the revenue side. Uh, First thing we always do is we start with the sales and marketing plan. So that takes about a month. So we're starting that actually two months prior to when the budget's due. Because the first month is what we're doing is working on uh, the sales and marketing plan. The next thing is uh, make sure always when you're creating those that your goals are achievable. That uh, we like to stretch them. But one thing we've learned in the past, and I've created some bad budgets in my day where it basically stretched the managers too far. And after a few months, they actually got almost given up on what the budget's going to be. So really make sure that they're achievable. It's good to stretch them, but keep them in reality. The next thing we look at is how many weekdays, weekends, and Fridays are in each month. And that can be a big factor, obviously, uh, which we're going to get to as we go through analyzing some financial statements. On the expense side, the first thing we do is we look at uh, different trends. Um, what would be an example of, of a trend lately in a financial budget? If you were creating a budget today for, let's see, a, a governmental budget which starts in June or July. What's something that's changed drastically in the last couple months that you'd have to look at? Price of water. Price of water. Anything else? Gasoline would be another one. It's gone up drastically in the last couple months. So those are the kind of things you need to look at as far as trends on the expenses and where it's going. Um, the other one would be any abnormal expenses. Uh, the best example I can think of is that is a, a pump going out on the golf course. That can be about a $15,000 expense. Superintendent comes to you, pump went out. Could be anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand um, dollars. Next is your fixed versus your variable costs. Um, next one would be any new expenses that you had going into next year or that you had last year. What could be an example of a of a new expense that might have been one time or happens every other year? I'll give you an example. Would be uh, a website. Uh, as I'm going to get to in the sales and marketing presentation a little bit later. Um, it's good to update your website at least every three years, sometimes every other year. So that'd be an example that you have to consider. There might be a new expense. And then the last one is any contracts. Making sure you're going through uh, all your contracts, seeing if they change. For example, cart leases is a big example. Did it go up? It, you know, year over year, it's going about 4% or CPI. Okay, uh, reading a financial statement. Um, obviously, the most important thing that I believe uh, is on there is you've got to. Uh, it helps you with your decision making. If you're studying a financial statement properly, it allows you to help make with decision making, where you're going to be flexing labor, where you're going to be cutting costs, etc. Uh, another thing is it determines your profitability and your performance. I know, for example, my bonus is totally tied to the profitability of our golf courses. So I think it's something very, you know, I'm sure a lot of you out there have the same situation. So obviously it can be a tool for your, for your performance as well. Okay, next I'd like to talk about uh, balance sheets. And as you can see, there's three main categories. There's the asset side, liabilities, owner's equity. The key with the balance sheet is always notice that the asset side has the exact same, equals the exact same number as your liabilities and owner's equity. Now I'm going to talk about some ba the balance sheet and some areas that affect everyone in this room if you're running a golf operation. The first one is cash on hand which has how much money you have in your cash banks and your cash drawers. <laughs> how often do you check your cash banks at your golf course? Don't everybody answer at once. Weekly. 
Weekly, that's fantastic. That's really good to catch uh, track on weekly. I'd recommend at least monthly, and you should anyway because it needs to be on the balance sheet. So the more often you do that, the better. Um, the other one that we really want to look at is operating cash. How much money is in the account? And that's very, very important, particularly in these months. If you look at November, December, January, February, you want to look at that and make sure you have enough money to pay your bills. As everybody knows, it's kind of like a bell curve as to how much cash you're going to have in the bank in the golf business in Southern California. Traditionally, in the winter months, it's a lot slower. So in those months, we're paying close attention to that to make sure we're going to have enough money to pay all of our bills. Next is accounts receivable. Um, the big part about that is you see uh, bill to groups and tournaments. What's a couple other areas in accounts receivable that might you want to look at at a golf course? If you're a private club, what would it be? Member dues. Member dues, exactly. Member dues can be a big one. I can just give an example. We manage a private club, and near the end of the year, we had a lot of bad debt. A lot of the members weren't paying their bills. And we actually almost missed an incentive that we, were, that we had to hit, but we had to collect about $20,000 of members that hadn't paid. So it's really, really important to take a look at that, particularly at the end of the year, looking to see uh, where you are with uh, accounts receivables from your members. Another one would be weddings. Make sure the weddings are paying. Okay, inventories. Obviously, everybody knows about inventories here, but the big ones would be in the golf shop as well as the food and beverage that everyone would be uh, involved with here. What's an example of um, some reasons why inventories might spike in the golf shop? Christmas. Christmas, the great one. Stocking up for Christmas. Anything else? Member guests, the great one. Tournament order. If you have a big tournament coming in, that you might have twenty extra thousand dollars worth of merchandise. Those are some things to look at. The other one with weddings is you'll see that spike a lot of times in the summertime when you need more food on hand because of uh, a lot of wedding value. Next one would be accounts payable. And you can tell here we're moving over to the liability section of the balance sheet. Um, accounts payable. The main one would be deposits that everyone would be involved with. What's a good management tool when you're looking at that number on a regular basis? How could you manage your for example, your tournament sale to make sure you're getting your money's in. I'll go through it. The, the best way is if all of a sudden you're seeing a spike in what's payable, what's due to you, I would highly recommend that you or whoever runs your tournament just sit down with them and find out why. Um, because what you want to do is make sure you keep those receivables coming in on, or payables coming in on a regular basis. It doesn't matter with the deposits. Because what happens is they might not be collecting enough deposits on their uh, tournaments. Does that make sense, Kimberly? Okay, next one is uh, under an income, uh, gift certificates. In the state of California, uh, gift certificates never expire. So it's really important to keep track of that and know where it's at. But there is a tax law that after a certain number of years, you can't actually take the cash away, cash away from gift certificates and put it back into your financial statement. So. It's something to always keep an eye on to know exactly where you are in your gift certificate uh, total account. Um, this uh, is the financial statement departments. Um, all these different departments here roll up to a consolidated financial. What we're going to focus on predominantly today is going to be the golf operation side as well as some food and beverage. Okay, could everyone just take a look at this financial statement and tell me what you see going on with the financial statement here? Can everyone see it first off? No. They can't. Uh -oh. Can't see the numbers at all? Okay. It's going to be a little more difficult. But um, one thing when we're going through the revenue here is you see there's, on the budget side, okay, this is the first off, it's consolidated financial for a month. As you can see, they missed budget on the revenue side by 48000 but they hit it on by prior year by 34000 What does that mean sometimes when you're, Missing budget so bad, but you hit versus prior year. What do we do here? And these are some of our financial statements. So these are, these are things we've done well, as well as some mistakes. In this case, we probably made a mistake. What do you think happened there? Thank you, Jeff. Right, the budget. We missed the budget. What we did is we got a little too zealous in what we thought we were going to do for the year. Even though we did $34,000 better in revenue, we missed budget by last year. So we did some bad budgeting there. There you go. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Okay, Jeff, a little up. Yeah, there you go. 
Okay, the other thing I want to point out is, I don't know if you can see it down here, as you notice, the gross profit was $24,000 better than prior year, and we did $34,000 better revenue. Basically, we flowed down 70.5% of the profit or revenue that we made. We flowed into the profit, and that's actually really good. If you can do that at any point in time, 70 is the number that we're always looking for. If we can take our increased revenue and drop it to the bottom line with expenses and 70 plus percent of it goes to the bottom line, we're in a great place. So that's something to always consider and look at. Okay, this is an example. They're gonna consolidate financial area for the month. Um, continuing on, so again, we talked about the gross profit, 24%. Um, some things in this financial statement as well. We end up going with all the expenses, flowed down 29, thousand and change to the bottom line, which is an excellent flow through. The number that your owner is always going to look at, and this is something you really want to pay attention to, is the actual percentage of profit and the actual dollar amount. The reason being is that's their paycheck. Everybody here makes a paycheck. Our owners pay us. What they're looking at, this is their paycheck. And that's what we're constantly looking at as well. Are we succeeding in, in having the goal, the, the goals of the owner being hit in what their financial uh, demands or requirements are. Okay, this page is uh, just the golf page of a financial statement. This is for a year to date. Um, there again, as you can see here, uh, our revenues, we were up 36,000 greens fees, 84,000 cart, but we missed budget by greens fees by 131,000. There again, what would that be? Why, why do you think that happened? Weather could be. Also, we, we did, there again, the same financial. We did not do a good job of budgeting. We got a little too zealous in our budgeting process, but we thought we'd do. The other thing we did here, as you can tell, we raised cart fees. They went up drastically. But when we look at something like this, we also want to analyze what, you know, why did that happen? What's the reasoning behind that? We also changed the way we allocated out the cart fees. So that was a big part of it as well. Um, the other thing I want to make a note is you see, 64% of our cost of goods. That was better than prior year as well as better than last year. But as you notice, our pro shop revenues went down. So what does that mean we might have made a mistake on? What do you think we might have done there that, why that happened? Expenses are too high. Exactly, yeah. we, we got a little too greedy on our costs. Maybe we held the line too long on, on some of our merchandise costs and that caused our revenues to go down because people weren't purchasing much. much. Maybe we weren't discounting and getting rid of merchandise as quickly as we should have. So those kind of things when you're studying your financial statement to take a look at and see what's an area I can improve, and that's a perfect example uh, on the golf side of things. Uh, as you can see, superintendents, maintenance, they were spending a little bit too much money. They're up by, in, in year to date, 20 grand there. But the bottom line is gross profit improved by 230,000, or almost 230%, which is excellent. Um, the other part to look at on the golf side, as you notice, we had 58% in golf operating profit. Would everybody consider that good or bad? What's everybody trying to strive at your properties? I'm sorry, John, what was that again? It's 58% in golf prop in the golf page of the financial statement for year to date. We were at 58%. Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, that's, that's pretty darn good. That was a really, <laughs> really good year for us. Traditionally, anytime you can get that number, at 40% or greater, you're doing a really good job. So this was a pretty good year at this property. Okay, now we're gonna shift over to um, food and beverage side. Now this is just a small little snack bar, and this is a month. Um, I wanna point out some things here. There again, as you notice, our budget, from the revenue standpoint on the opposite side, we had uh, beat budget, but last year we were down by about $3,900. Uh, as you can see, we have about uh, 30.5 cost of goods sold which versus last year at 26%, we didn't do a good job anymore. On the flip side of that, our labor was at 21.9%, which is pretty good, better than budget, pretty close to last year. Uh, on this page, you can see we our profit percentage was 45.9%, which was actually pretty good. Anytime in, on a food and beverage page, if you can get anywhere close to 35% or better, you're doing, a, you're doing a pretty good job. 
Um, the challenge is, though, what we didn't do a good job with, as you can see, our revenues. We were down by, you mentioned 3,900, and 2,900 less than prior year. So we beat budget, but we did not do a good job versus last year. So any, anytime you're doing a food and beverage page, the first thing you want to do is look at and see how is your rounds. Is your rounds the reason why your revenue is so far down? Was it maybe a mix of the business, too? Just like with golf tournaments changing your rate for uh, the entire golf product, what happened with the food and beverage? If all of a sudden you don't have as many turnaround rounds going through there, it can affect you greatly because instead of having, um, you know, getting 7 or $8 per person from a standard golfer, you can get $20, 25 $30, depending if they're dining or not, on a tournament. So you want to look at all those different um, reasons as to why you could have dropped your revenue. Okay, now we're going to talk about flexing expenses. Um, we've all had to do that in recent times. Obviously, the challenge uh, of our business in the last, uh, last decade almost now. But um, what the goal is with flexing expenses, what you want to do is maintain the budgeted percentages. Um, and I'm going to get to an example here in a second. To do that, you need to check the point of sale system on a regular basis to determine what your revenues daily, weekly, and monthly are going to be. And then you want to flex and adjust your uh, operating expenses accordingly. Um, then also adjusting your key sheet and your staffing to uh, account for that. One thing we've learned, though, um, we've been burnt doing this at times, and I'm sure you all have. For example, we have a course called Twin Oaks, which is very close to the freeway. And so what happens is sometimes when we're flexing costs and we cut labor earlier in the day when we have a slower day, the sun comes, like today, sun comes back out, all of a sudden we could have 120 golfers in the afternoon. So there's an art to it, as everyone knows in this room, but know the trends of your golf course. Twin Oaks and Oaks North, for example, are close to freeways. They get a lot of afternoon play. There's other courses, Ranch Vernon, that does not get as much afternoon play. So you always want to be looking and knowing what the trends of your, uh, your golf course are when you're flexing costs. Um, I want to go through a quick example of it here that we created um, and how we're always looking to flex if need be for a month. The budget revenue is $200,000. Because what we've projected out for the year is that we're only going to do $150,000 in revenue. So as you can see here, we were supposed to make a net profit of 90,000 or 45 percent was going to flow to the bottom line. So as we went through the month, we realized we're not going to hit it. So what we did here is just as a base example is we flexed costs. This is just a pure example, obviously. Flexed costs accordingly 25 percent of all the different uh, costs, whether it's labor or operating expenses, to get to our bottom line number. So we got to 68 percent, which is 45 percent net profit. So we created the same net profit, but we did it by cutting costs in all the different areas. The challenge is a lot of this doesn't happen because you don't know, unless you're really studying your tournament bookings, that you're going to be so far behind at the beginning of the month. So a more real example would be something like this. There you have the same numbers. If you had $200,000 budgeted, that your goals were to, to make profit, in this case it's 35%, halfway through the month or a week into the month, you're realizing that you're not going to hit your number. You've already spent the labor for the first week, and a lot of the operating supplies were already purchased. So the best way to do it at that point would, would be to start really cutting on your operating costs. And as you can see in this example, we cut costs of operating up to 40% in some areas to allow us to hit our financial number for the month. What are some examples um, that you could cut to allow that to, to happen? What are some variable costs that you can cut on a regular basis to make sure that happens? I'll give the first one, scorecards. Score, let's say you had a scorecard order coming in. It was budgeted. You were supposed to spend it that month. You might hold off on scorecards. What's another one? Range balls. Range balls, a great one. Range balls, excellent. The other one's on the golf maintenance side where you can save the most is, let's say there was a mower that went down that you don't use all the time and it was going to get repaired. Work with your superintendent and say, you know what, you hold off doing that for a month or two until we get back to, to some good months. Um, tree trimming is another one on the golf course. They have planned to have a tree trimmer come out there. You might want to hold off doing that for a month or two to, to get back on course. Okay, uh, next page is uh, about reading a financial statement. This is just how ours look. Everyone's probably looks a little bit different. But as you can see, it, this page has the total golf stats. Whenever we're looking at a financial statement, we look at the current month, the year to date, and then what the different categories are here. And then typically, year to date or the month, we start with an actual number that's loaded in there, a budget, prior year, a 
budget variance and then a last year variance. Does everybody have financial statements that look similar to this? Just from a look standpoint when you're analyzing it? Okay. Typically on the left side is the month, on the right side is the year to date. Okay, I uh, wanted to go through uh, a golf stats page here. Can everybody see that or not? No? Okay. Well, let's, I'm gonna go through it. I'll, I'll explain it then. It's a little more challenging here, but we'll, uh, we'll do it. As you can see, if you can't see it here, and last year on the weekday rounds, we were down by 208 rounds. Fridays were up by 232, and uh, weekends were up by 129. What's the reason why in that month, versus last year anyway, that we could be so far up in Friday and so far down on weekday? What could it be? Five Fridays that month. Great, that's exactly it. Five Fridays, that, and that's exactly what happened in this, in this month here, so there were five Fridays in that month opposed to four the prior year, there was actually 16 weekdays in that year opposed to 18 in the prior year. So that can be a huge, huge factor as to where you are with budgeting. So when, again, we talked about it before. When you're budgeting, make sure you look at every month, number of weekdays, Fridays, weekends. Um, some other things we always look at is trends. Um, on this financial statement, one of the areas that we're not doing well is what we call Southern California rounds or public rounds is we're down in each category, whether it's weekday, Friday, or weekend, which is not good. The challenge is we replaced it with cheaper business at this property. We're replacing, and I'm sure it's everyone's experience, replacing with twilight and discount, which can be a challenge over time. It can drop your, your rate. Um, the only advantage we have with that is our tournament rounds were going up. As you can see in both categories, budget and versus last year, we were up in tournament rounds for the entire year. So when you're going through your financial statements, always look at these kind of trends and see where you are um, as far as uh, trends that are being consistent on both last year as well as budget. Okay, this will be a total golf page. Um, there again, I apologize for everyone not being able to see this, but this is in the yellow here is an example. Um, there's a 20, over $20,000 expense that happened uh, in the prior and some operating uh, costs. So even though our month looked really good here, 20,000 was due to the fact that we had a, a, a unique expense the prior year, I think that was a website actually, that we had in the prior year that did not uh, happen in the next year. So even though we like to feel good about ourselves here on this month, it really wasn't. It was really the fact that we had a uh, unique experience in the prior year. Uh, this is another example, if you look at our, our year to date on the cost of goods and the financials, we had 65% uh, cost of goods but there again, what was bad is we did 11,000 less than uh, budget and 4,000 less than prior year. So the same same trend. We probably held rate too long and didn't discount part, didn't discount quick enough on some of our merchandise. That's why our cost of goods was so much better, but our sales wasn't. So always look at that ratio as you're going through it. Uh, now I want to shift over to some food and beverage. Um, same thing on the food and beverage side. Uh, on cost of goods. As you can see, we had a 31% uh, food costs, but our food sales were down 48 to budget and 5,500 the prior year. On the flip side of that, our cost of goods on beverage were, were not as good, but our sales went up by 16,000 in first budget and 15,000 versus last year. So always look at that ratio on the food and beverage side. It's the, pretty much the same equation. Sometimes, if you get a little greedy on your price, your sales might drop. Okay, um, payroll. This property for this year did a really good job. We were at 24.79%. The challenge was, is our benefits went up drastically. So it really hurt us. We saved quite a bit of money uh, versus prior year. 11,000, 15,000 versus uh, prior year. But our benefits just basically neutralized it all. So keep an eye on that benefit line item. The big one you can see here, this is what you gotta watch in the kitchens as well as in golf maintenance, is workman's comp went up. As you can see, it was about a little over 9,000 of it in both categories versus budget and prior year. So what happened to us there, the reason the benefits were so high is we had a bad workman's comp issue at this property. And uh, it cost us for, the, for that uh, year on our labor. The good news is though, we made 11,000 more than prior year. And although the challenge was we didn't, uh, in this budget by um, about twenty-nine, almost thirty thousand dollars. 
So it was a good year versus prior. Very good. Not versus budget. All right. Any questions on the financials? Okay, food and beverage. First, can I see a hand? So how many people are in charge of the food and beverage at your, at your property? Okay. About six or so, six or seven. Okay. Well, I'll go fairly quick to this then, but I wanted to talk a little about the food and beverage and some things that we really look at um, that help quite a bit. I think it's also important, this is something, even if you're responsible for the beverage cart or even the snack bar, that could help you out. Um, let's talk about how do you make food and beverage profit. Very similar to merchandise in a lot of ways. Obviously cost of goods, you've got pricing, vendor pricing. The difference is we've got spoilage there. That can be a big factor. Portion control, menu build outs, which we'll get to in a second, and theft. Um, what's an example of uh, vendor pricing that's changed drastically in food and beverage in recent months? Delivery. Delivery charge, right, with gas surcharge, it's a good one. The price of beef. The price of beef has gone up drastically in recent months, and they're saying it's going to continue to go up. So that's something you really need to, to take, take a look at. Next is labor. Um, very similar to the golf operations, you've got fixed costs versus uh, variable costs. One thing we've noticed at some of our properties is if you don't, um, if you have too much management labor in the food and beverage side, it's very challenging to make it in the winter months. For example, I'll give an example. Our course, uh, Twin Oaks, we've got a chef, a food and beverage man manager, and a catering sales manager. I can tell you it's almost impossible for us to make profit with those three salaries in December, January, and February. For that exact reason, well, I'm sorry, not December, but January and February. You just got too much labor that's fixed that you have to pay for January and February, and not enough volume coming in because you're slow as months. So always look at that. Can your operation afford a food and beverage manager, chef, catering sales? We really need to look at that. But we made a commitment to do that because we believe that we're going to have enough wedding business throughout the entire year to make up for that. Okay, cost of goods. As everybody knows, it's basically figured out the exact same way as uh, on the golf side with your total sales divided by your costs. One thing to take a note at, we're trying to get our food costs around 30% and our beverage costs at 25% or less. So those are good goals and numbers to, to try to achieve. Okay, this is called a core card. And what we do, we use these for is to establish pricing of our food and beverage. Does everybody see that? What we do is we break down every cost of a hot dog. When you look at a hot dog, you think, okay, what's the cost of the hot dog and the bun? But there's a lot more to that. How much is the side? How much is the relish, the onion, the mayo, ketchup, mustard, etc.? We even put a number in there for waste. We, put, we figure out it's 5%. We know there's going to be waste. How many times do you see the hot dog on the hot dog roller at the end of the day? Hopefully those are getting thrown out. So, <laughs> or we're not eating them anyway. But that, you know there's going to be some waste. Um, and we might even be lighting that 5%. We probably should adjust that for hot dogs because you're going to have more waste there than, than most other uh, types of food. But this is something I highly recommend you do for every single food and beverage item. If anybody ever wanted, wanted uh, this grid, we've got them laid out for pretty much every type of food imaginable. I'd be glad to send them to you if you ever need them. But these really help out for uh, figuring out what your costs are going to be. As you can tell, we kept it within line. We've got 26.18%. Um, Gross profit on this would be $5.54 per hot dog. Okay, menu build out. Here's another thing that we do for uh, all of our uh, menu items. We create a build out sheet. And the reason we do this is for consistency. We want, whether it's Joe or John or Susie, we want to try and create the exact same hamburger. So what we do is we lay out all the ingredients. We do a step-by-step -step procedure, how to, how to create or build the uh, menu item and present it that way and we always put a picture in there. I highly recommend, even if you're in a snack bar, it's really, really important because so many times we've had complaints at times, my sandwich was too small, you know, there's not enough meat on it. You know, or the sandwich was the greatest sandwich I ever had and had a lot in it. So the same type of thing is make sure you're very consistent in that. Uh, particularly if you're watching your food costs, you know, how much meat you're putting in it. As we talked about in the core card before, you wanted the exact same amount on every single sandwich to make sure you can uh, maintain a consistent product as well as consistent profitability. Okay, then on menu creation, um, 
what we always try to do is put our most, our, our greatest dollar margin to center. There you go. Not the most expensive items, because sometimes they're not the most profitable. We put the, the item that's going to make us the most profits in the center. The reason being is everybody's eyes naturally just gravitate towards the center to see where it's at. So I think that's where the main entree is going to be. So they drive right to that. So always put your most profitable items, items you want to sell the most in this region. Um, the other thing we do is we run monthly sales analysis uh, at all of our properties every month to see what sells the most, what sells the, you know, the least, what's the dog and what's the one that's, that's uh, having the most sales. We try to get the dogs out. About at least every quarter we try to change the menu to see what is selling, also just to freshen it up so guests keep coming and just don't think it's the same thing over and over again, particularly for your regulars. If you're a private club, that's really important because you have the same guests pretty much every day. So really take a look at that, look and see what's selling, what's not, and then take the, the dogs out and replace them with something to freshen up the menu. Okay. Any uh, questions on uh, food and beverage? Yes, sir. When did you have that hot dog broken down? The, the cost of the hot dog? What did you say you sold it for? Did you say $5 profit on each hot dog? It, yes. At this property, this is a resort. That's where you the, get away with it. You can't read the numbers from here. Yeah, let me, let me go through it. It's a good question. So, um, basically, the hot, dog, the hot dog bun was $0.22. Cents. Hot dog was $0.42. Cents. The side, though, was actually the most expensive thing on the item. This is at a private club, and we do a nice... Uh, potato salad and coleslaw with it, so it's a nice, a nice deal there. So that's the side, but then you've got all the other things—the the relish, onion, etc. that you're going to be used. So if the subtotal comes to a dollar eighty-seven, we have waste at five percent, which is nine cents, totaling a dollar ninety-six. Our actual raw cost for that hot dog was dollar dollar ninety-six. We sell it there again. This is a resort, so higher than a lot of our properties. We can sell a hot dog for a seven fifty. And uh, our food cost is 26.18%. But there again, we have some of our properties, we don't, we're not gonna put that side, the side's 50 cents. So we gotta make, we gotta sell it for another $2 essentially because we have that side on there. But the resort, people are wanting more than just a basic hot dog in a, on a plate. They're wanting it to be garnished up. Yes? Factor in labor? We do when we're looking at it. Yes, it depends on different items. I just did a, that's a great question. I just did it on the, uh, the food, co the cost of goods itself right here. But we put it, then we do another one on labor to see what our final profitability is going to be on the entire item. Great question. You yes, also sir. do uh, like packaging costs to go boxes or plates or? We do. We put that in there typically as well. These are all, yeah, great questions. Absolutely. That's, especially with tournaments, we do our tournament box lunch, for example. That's a big, that sometimes could be the, one of the bigger costs in the entire uh, box lunch is sometimes the presentation, depending on how you're going to make it. Or the, you know, a lot of times you have the clamshells if it's to go order, or the plates, depending on where it's at. Yes. Any other questions on food and beverage? Okay, great question. Okay, now we're going to shift over to sales and marketing. And I wanted to start with some stats from a group called Pellucid. Has anyone heard of Pellucid before? Okay. Great. Um, the reason I thought it was very important was to show you some of the trends that are happening in our business so you know how to, you know, so the best way in which to market to them. Because it's definitely changing. And you'll see there's some scary, scary stats in this. Did everyone read this grid first off or not? Not really. Not really? Okay. Well, let me, uh, let me kind of go through with you. Um, the first part I want to talk about is it's by age, broken out by age. As you can see, with juniors from 7 to 17, uh, Early career, which is 18 to 34, and then mid-career, which is 35 to 54. So you can see the red box around there. We're down over the last three years 11% of the amount of players playing in that category. The only area we're up is seniors at 65 plus, which we're up by 4%. Um, the other area we need to point out is from 0 to 34 into income, we're up by 3%. Uh, from 35K and above, though, we're down essentially averaging an 8, 8.5%. Eight what does that tell us? What do we think that, that means with those stats? Let's start with the age part. What's going to happen in 15 years from now? 20 years from now? We're going to lose more golfers. We're going to lose a lot of golfers unless we make some major changes. The other part is the reason it, it kind of backs up the stats with the seniors, they're retired. They're not having income anymore. So the zero 
to $35,000 salaries are up by 3%, which almost mirrors the seniors, which kind of validates the stats as well. So the big part of it is we're going to lose these seniors as they get older, shall we say, or die off for that matter in 15, 20 years. And we're not catching, the, especially the early career people. Um, the other part to take a look at is the amount of rounds played. As you can see, single rounds, casual rounds, and involvers are all down, so particularly single rounds, 11%, 7%, 8% respectively. Now, with folks that are playing a lot of golf, 40 plus rounds with their against seniors, they're still holding, holding pretty close. They're only 3% down. But the big challenge is, what this tells us, is if you're 35 to 40 and younger, we're losing golfers at about 10%, opposed to what we did three years ago. The other challenge is, we're getting all seniors at the lower, you know, people are making less wages. And most importantly, they're not playing as much. The golfers are playing a lot less golf. Yes, John? 2012 same as 2011 or better or worse? Or? Um, this is a three, what they did here is they used a three year trend on this. Um, so it's basically taking 11, or 9, 10, and 11. Uh, we're down, let's see, the stats are just coming out, but it's going to be pretty, we're going to be pretty close to where we were in 11s, where we are 12, pretty, pretty close. They're saying it's going to be up just a titch, but we'll see. But more importantly, you got to look at the long trend. This is not, I don't think, you know, don't look at a month or a year. This is a three-year trend that they used at the end of 11 to figure these numbers out. But this is where we need to really look at when we're marketing. We've got to market to those groups in that 40 and younger group a different way than we've been doing or we're going to start losing more and more golfers. So that's why I want to start out the marketing part about the trends as to where things are, are going. Any questions on the stats? Yes, sir. John, I mean, I agree with everything you're saying. I agree, I like it. I mean, with these baby boomers, there's going to be, I mean, the, the astronomical number is going to really increase higher and higher. We're all going to, our, yeah, our people are going to start retiring. How, how, can we, how can we account for all those retirees that are going to start happening in the next five, ten years? That's a great point, Mark. As you see here on the uh, age chart, 65 and older, they're playing a lot, 4% more. Mm -hmm. Basically, 55 to 64, which is really the boomers, right? That's the boomer category. They're down 1%. So the older boomers, they're playing a lot more golf. The younger boomers are playing less. But remember, they're getting also people that are 55 that are outside that, that boomer age range. So they're pretty much holding flat. The bigger concern is there again, people that are 54 and younger, that's where we're really starting to, to uh, miss the boat, so to speak. But you're right, thank God, for the, if we didn't have the baby boomers right now, as bad as it is out there, we'd be in a lot worse shape. Thank God for the baby boomers. So we've got to make sure we keep capturing those bit, that business for the next 10 years, but we've got to look at ways to market to the younger generation so they continue and they can have the same amount of uh, enjoy golf as much as the boomers are enjoying. Okay, here's another stat. Um, as you can see, this is golf participation of ages 25 to 44. In 1992, of the golfers that were playing, it was 45.2% of the golfers were playing, uh, were in that age range of 25 to 44. Today, well, 2011, it was 31%. That is a massive drop, absolutely massive drop. And if that continues, we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be in trouble. You know, if this keeps going down, it's not today, but it's where we're going to be in 15 years from now, 20 years from now. And there again, I know you're saying, how is this tied to marketing? But it really does in how we look at uh, uh, adjusting to what our, our audience is and where it's going to be 15 years from now. Uh, here are just some fun facts. Basically, uh, what this tells us is that frequent and occasional golfers uh, account for 90 plus percent of our rounds. So that's the other part. Seniors are playing a lot more rounds of golf because they've got the time. What happens when we lose a lot of those in the next 10 to 15 years? So it's important that we capture those and get them into golf where they take it up on a regular basis rather than just one round here, they play in the annual company golf tournament. How do we get them to become core golfers? Okay, um, here's the recreational winners and losers since 2002. Okay, so this is the trend, the difference what's changed. This is an important slide to take a look at. Can everybody see this one? 
these are the sports right here that are winning. Okay, as you can see, yoga is leading the pack. I can't stand it, but leading the pack. It's 101 percent. It's growth since 2002. Okay, running, hiking, tennis, walking are all up. Running, my other sport I don't like. So. Sports that are not doing as well, skiing, swimming, bowling, and golf. We're down 20, uh, just shy of 23% versus where we were in 2002. If you look at this grid, you chop it in half. What's the difference in these sports here opposed to these sports here? Cost. 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 The ones on the right that are all green, they don't cost anything to play. You can, I can walk, run, yoga, anything like, even tennis for free. Golf, skiing, even to go to a, you know, a pool, you know, unless you have one in your backyard, a pool, whatever, competitive cost, bowling, same thing. So we've really got to look at that as well. How do we make it affordable for people to get into golf? It's basically, a, this is an absolute awakening here that cost does matter to a lot of these people. So we've got to figure a way to get uh, clubs in people's hands and get them out to the golf courses for free or next to free in the beginning and hoping that they get hooked to golf. There again, I know this isn't exactly marketing, but it does tie to it. Any questions on this slide? All right, so moving into marketing. Um, first off, I always want to look at what, how do golfers buy a golf round of golf or a lesson? Word of mouth, advertising, internet, uh, direct marketing from your own uh, course or from an instructor. One thing uh, I totally believe in, there's no homes, home runs in golf marketing. It takes a lot of small successes. When we go through it every year, we look at our marketing plans and we build them. We know we're going to try 45 to 50 things. And when we look at that, we're getting the year started, we know that probably five to 10 of those aren't going to work. And our goal is to cut bait on those as quickly as possible and either put more money in another area or create something else to put money in towards. So always look at that. There's a lot of things you got to do well. It takes a lot of work. And there is no, one thing I've learned, I'd love to know it if there was, but there is no silver bullet. Um, branding. The key is you got to know your property's brand, or if you're an instructor, know what delineates you from your competition. Um, example, at JC Golf, uh, our brand is quality, value, variety, and something for everyone. We believe we have a course for everyone, whether it's Oaks North, where the beginner can learn to play golf, or Ranch Farm Inn, where you want to take a client out and have a good round of golf with a five-star meal. Um, some examples that might be for your property, home of the best greens in the county, uh, the most scenic course in the county, and if you're an instructor that maybe you specialize in women golf instruction, know what your niche is and who you are and what you're all about and pound that message home to everybody you can, you can get your hands on. Um, the other thing is you want to discover the strengths relative to your competition. We're always looking to see what, what they have as well. What you don't want to do is say you have the best greens in the county and your course next door says they have the best greens in the county. That's not going to work real well. Delineate yourself from your competition and, and know, know who you are. Uh, the other part is understand your local market. Understand who your customer are, customer is, and what they want. Um, I'll give an example of some uh, something that we uh, or I failed miserably on with thinking I knew my customer. When I first came to JC Resorts 14 years ago, we have a JC Players Card program, a loyalty program, and I said we're going to have uh, we're going to have the best tournaments. We've never had tournaments here before. We're going to have the greatest championships. We're going to have a men's championship, women's, member guests, we do all these things. So we did it. And two years in a row, I got anemic response, like 45 to 50 people. I was almost giving it away just to try to create this tournament atmosphere. Never worked. Fast forward about four years, we came up with a concept called Golfers Gone Wild, which was fun. We, it was just a big scramble. Basically, it was a reason to drink and hang out with your friends. That's all it was. We had, we had beer sponsors, Hooters were involved. We sent an email blast out. We had the greatest open rate we've ever had in the history of our entire company. Who's going to front, beer, beer vendors, all this, sold it out. We're going to do one shotgun. We ended up doing two shotguns. It's sold it over a year since. Basically, well, I thought I knew my customer, but I really didn't. They wanted fun and entertainment and beer. I was trying to give them a championship, more old school championship, the, the golf that I grew up on. So I think it's important to really know who your customer is and market to them. Um, the next part is always uh, keep a pulse on your uh, customers. How many of you do surveys? regular basis okay great we uh, we do surveys for every single customer that books off of our our web and we put it on the receipt where they can send it 
uh, send in a uh, uh, survey and get $5 off in the next round. We want to constantly know what is happening with our customer. Um, I'll tell you, sometimes they're really painful. There's nothing worse than you wake up on a Saturday morning from Friday and you got four horrendous surveys. It, it doesn't, uh, yes? John, what's your participation level with that? Great point. We get, per course, uh, about three a day. So it's about 2%, one and a half to 2%, yeah. depending on the day and the time of year. So yeah. Now, I'm gonna give another example of an area that we, I'm sharing here, that we, I'll say I messed up on. At our Twin Oaks property this past year, we elected not to oversee. And we made, we were going back and forth. We thought it'd be better agronomically, obviously in the long run for the, for the summer if we didn't oversee. And we thought we could get away with it with our customers. I can tell you it was an absolute utter mistake. We, I made a mistake by doing so. I'm getting three to four sometimes surveys a day about the course conditions at Twin Oaks. Now, it's not lush green. It still is a good playable condition, but obviously golfers associate yellow or a, or a brownish uh, grass to uh, not a great playing environment. So I highly recommend whenever you make your, those decisions, we sh what we should have done there as an example, we should have went out and surveyed our customers before we actually went and decided not to oversee <laughs> and found out what it was. So always, you know, if sometimes you think you know your customer, do you really always question it? You know, we made some mistakes that I just shared there and always want to look at that. I highly recommend if you don't survey your customers on a regular basis though, you do, it's, it's eye-opening. Sometimes it's painful to hear, but I can tell you we've done a ton of guest recoveries with guests we would have absolutely positively lost. And if we didn't have those surveys, we would have never known it. They just would have went somewhere else and now we're able to make a guest recovery because our managers call every single one of them to make sure that they're, uh, they're happy at the end of the day. Okay, now I'll talk about database. Um, first, we have a saying, whoever has the largest database wins. So the most golf, that's for the most part true. It also has to be quality. Uh, garbage in, garbage out. But the three things that we're looking to get every single customer is their name, email, and zip code. We've gone away from their address. Basically snail mail, it's just not cost efficient anymore. So the three things we're always trying to capture, name, email, and zip code. We also want to have it targeted uh, by the geographical location. Obviously, the zip is where they live, but also their senior, beginner, or in some cases a city resident, depending on what your, your property is. A loyalty program, the beauty about this database is you can market to them uh, without having to, uh, especially if you're gonna give a discount of some sort, without having to launch it out to the general public. Um, some examples of ways to capture email is offering rewards to your staff. We do this on a, on a quarterly basis to re-energize the staff to direct, capture as many emails as possible. Guest sign-in sheets. The big one of late is tea time confirmations and then event raffles. Okay, now moving on to emails. Um, what we always look at is, number one, are we selling something, just, you know, stressed inventory, uh, example would be tea times, or are we just doing general communications, like a tip of the month? Um, frequency, the key is commitment to frequency. Uh, we recommend at least every other week, we, we issue an email every single week to our, to our entire database. But I highly recommend if you, you, if you get started on it, you've not done it before, you wanna make sure you do it at least every other week, which is only, think about it, it's not a lot to communicate to your database, it's only 26 times a year. Um, there again, segmentation of emails by seniors, juniors, loyalty members, you always wanna make sure your databases are broken out by the different categories. Subject line, the subject line is the most critical part of the email. This is a stat, 69% of all emails that are spammed out are done just purely from the um, subject line. So you wanna make sure that those hit home and have some meaning to them. You don't want any more than 55 characters. Um, next is scheduling. We schedule our emails traditionally on Tuesdays, but Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursdays are the best day. We also send them out around four o'clock, but you wanna send them out between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Why would that be? Why would you want to set up between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m.? Exactly. So when you first wake up, you're looking at it, you're more focused. If you get during the middle of the day, we're all getting, you know, 50, 100 emails, 200, whatever it happens to be in the day, it's just another email. If you're in the morning, you're a little more focused on it, you get in front of your computer, coffee, you're looking at it, you're studying a little bit more. So it's always best when you wake up. Yes, Alan? John, can you use an example of an email that would be spammed as opposed to one that wouldn't because of the subject line? Yes. Um, first off, it has to capture, I'm, Great to see you said that because um, a lot of it is creating urgency. So if you, it's basically enticing them to say, 
you know what, this is something that I want, opposed to, oh, another golf, you know, another golf vendor. Um, I know this past week, and I actually got rid of three people that I'm on their email database just because I haven't looked at them in a while. Because they haven't sent me anything that really lured me into wanting to buy their product or look at their product. So that's, that's the biggest part about it, is you've got to constantly be giving them a hook that'll get them enticed to studying your, your, your message, what you're trying to communicate. So when, uh, when you say spam, you're talking about the recipient actually choosing to approve to, that email. Yeah, exactly, to spam you out, yep. Unsl <laughs> yeah. Unsubscribe, essentially. Um, and then creating an urgency example would be uh, by noon this Wednesday, uh, put a swing back in your game. This will be an example of a teaching one. So you may be doing an offer, but you're giving them until Wednesday for whatever special offer you might want to do. But always try to put a time frame around it. Otherwise, you're just going to sit in your in inbox and you might not look at it. Um, there again, creating a sense of urgency. Open rate. Does everyone know what your open rate is in your property? Everybody okay, Mike? Twenty two percent. Twenty two that's excellent. Twenty two percent is great on the average any day. Yes, John? Um, one thing on the open rate, uh, with with the way emails are sent now, you can look at it without opening it. That can be uh, at times that can skew the numbers. Absolutely correct. Yes. Does everyone know what John what John's saying there? Sometimes you can pop it up on your screen, you can just be clicking down, actually not click uh, into the site or into the email. It's, it wouldn't count as an open, but really someone looked at it. So that's a great point. Sometimes they are, are uh, confusing. That's why a 22% is fantastic. And, and on the technology part, don't some computers spam it out? Um, you were talking about spam, but the computer actually doesn't allow it into your email, correct? It does. It depends on how, if, you have, if you're trying to do it yourself, there's only so many you can send out at a certain time. Um, if you're working with a company, that's what they're paid to do, essentially, is to send them out to make sure they don't get spammed back, because they send them out um, so it doesn't look like one person just hit send on 4,000 emails. It's important to have that too and know that and test it. What we do too is we put uh, some of our own team, team's emails in there. So we're seeing to make sure that we get email on a regular basis, number one. And number two, to see if anybody's get, ever getting spammed out. So we put a lot of test emails in there to eliminate that. But open rate is very, very important. Let you know uh, who's actually paying attention and who's not. Uh, advertising. This has changed drastically in the last 10 years. Uh, I remember, just an example, in San Diego, the Union uh, Tribune uh, used to be the place to market. And today, we did uh, a little analysis of it. Our, my younger generation of marketing team said, John, the UT is dead, it's dead. I said, no, we gotta keep doing it. We did a major test on it, and they were right. I was wrong. It absolutely has dropped off to, we used to be able to get four times the revenue. So if we spent $1,000 on that, I get at least $4,000 worth of people spending business at our property. We just did it recently, did a test. It's cost about the same, $1,000. The only difference, we're only getting about 800 uh, in revenue from those, from those ads. So it's absolutely changed. Newspaper's kind of dying. The one that's not, though, is pay-per-click. Does everyone know what pay-per-click campaign is? Clicking on different sites, basically advertising on someone else's website. Um, highly recommend it if you're not, not doing it today. Um, let's talk about the website. Okay, the first part is you always want to make sure you have the best rate guarantee on your website. It's very, very important because you want to be driving traffic to your website, not not somebody else's like IE Golf Now or someplace else. So oh, I highly recommend you always have the best rate at your site. Um, how many of you out here have a mobile or tab tablet website? <coughs> okay, so about a third of the room. Just so everyone knows, 32% of web traffic, 32% is now on the web. So if you don't have a mobile or tablet site, you're missing 32% of the customers. Remember when we talked about the slides with Pellucid, that younger generation, they're all looking at your website, yeah, your website through a, a mobile or a tablet site. They are not looking at it um, uh, through the standard channels. So I highly recommend if you don't have it that you get a, uh, a mobile site put together. Um, we talked about uh, website redesign, very important. We try to do it every two years. Uh, three would be about the most you'd ever want to do it. You've got to make sure you continually change it for a new look, but also to stay relevant. It's changing so so rapidly that if you don't change your website every three years, you could be getting left behind. And there again, that younger generation, they're looking at things like that. They're looking at the new and the un unique. That's what keeps them coming back. Uh, next one is uh, SEO, or search engine optimization. 
Does everyone know what page they are on Google? Okay, a couple hands. I highly recommend uh, you go home tonight and you search your golf course. For us, we search, search San Diego Golf or Rancho Bernardo Wind Golf or Rancho Bernardo Golf, Encinitas Golf, whatever it happens to be. We search it on a regular basis, at least weekly. We're looking to see where we are on the search engine. So when Google pops up, we want to be on the first page. If you're not on the first page, it's going to be challenged. The second page, if you're past the second page, you're not getting looked at. First page, you really want to be on the first page, and it's worth uh, changing your website around or paying to do that through uh, SEO. Um, there again, that's where that younger generation we're missing is absolutely looking for golf, and that's what we want to be, uh, be studying. Third-party vendors. Um, only got a few minutes left here, but how many are in golf now? Okay, it's a lot of hands. Um, there's some advantages to them. Obviously, they can give you some revenue. But make note, uh, even if they're driving customers to you, they're not loyal to your course. They're still going to be loyal to the third-party vendor, i.e. Golf Now. Um, the disadvantages is, obviously, it's going to erode your price over time. It can be very challenging, and it's tough to uh, recruit that. Recruit that. Um, so we'll keep going, I guess. Social media. We've got a couple minutes left here. Um, how many have a Facebook page? Okay, that's good. Um, three things, to, uh, ways to grow uh, social media. First, you've got to engage them. There again, by uh, asking questions. Uh, educate them. Tell them about events or golf tips. For teachers, is a great way, social media. Give them golf tips. And entertain them. Uh, golf jokes, fun facts, etc. which is only unique from our traditional golf, uh, golf marketing. But engage, educate, entertain, that's how you can grow your social media. It's very, very important. There you go, going back to the younger generation. That's how they're, uh, that's how they're looking, what they're looking at. Uh, direct sales. This is a big focus for us tonight. We have a saying, saying that we want to be fishing for whales, not minnows. And what we mean by that is, obviously, you have a direct sales team. It costs money. You have to have a, whether it's tournament sales or it's uh, wedding sales, it costs more money to have that, that person on, on staff. But it really works because there again, you're going to try and fish. So, so in this example, for a hundred-person tournament, rather than just trying to get one or two golfers at a time. So it's really, really important to make sure that you create a good uh, direct sales campaign. It does take a lot of time and commitment to work. Um, it's not easy. And the key is there again is to have goals that are put together at the beginning of the year, your sales and marketing plan, and communicated to your tournament sales director to make sure that they are really focused on that, so they can increase your your business. Community relations, um, very important, particularly for teachers and tournament directors. So if you're an instructor, I highly recommend either going to the Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary, uh, local school activities. Uh, I'll give an example of one of our instructors, Paul Mernicki, who's done a great job of growing this business over the last two years at Twin Oaks. He goes to all these events, he's active with the schools. Uh, he actually is willing to give a free lesson to all of our JC players, card holders as well, one free 30 minute lesson, betting that he's gonna get um, business to come, and he's done a great job. He, he just talked to him just the other day, and he is so busy, basically can't do any more lessons than he's doing right now. But he gave a lot in the beginning to make this happen, and it's a great success story. So I highly recommend you get involved with community relations if you're an instructor, as well as if you're selling tournaments. Next is uh, return on investment. Um, we're spending a lot of money on all these marketing campaigns. How many of you track all of your marketing campaigns? Okay, that's great. A lot, a lot of folks out there. Uh, we believe it's really important because if you're going to spend all this money, you've got to be able to justify it. Because what we do for all of our campaigns on a uh, monthly basis, we look at how much we spent and what the return was. Bring it down by web, advertising, pay per click, referrals, etc. It's an example of a private club we have um, and what we spent and what we marketed to get the return. So, as you can see, sometimes also the things that maybe bring the greatest return dollar wise, it, it also matters how much you spent to get there. For example, probably the best one was our pay per click. We spent 600 bucks. To get seventy-two hundred dollars in revenue, six hundred dollars of return on that. Even though the web did well, we spent you know thirteen hundred more on that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, advertising. Even though advertising brought us seventy-two hundred dollars, we also took the risk of spending um, almost six thousand dollars to make that happen. So look at the things that are going to be your greatest return on investment. Also, what you put in and what you're gambling on that marketing initiative and what the return is going to be. Okay, any, uh, any questions on sales or marketing? 
Yes. I did. Th thanks, Judge. Yeah. Rian, okay, because Rian gave me the five minute look, so that's no. why. I, <laughs> thank you, Rian. Yeah, that was good. Um, okay, so discounting model. Um, thank you, Jeff. This is actually very important. One thing we've learned is let's say you got an average rate of $50, and let's say your goal is to get $100, 100 rounds a day, which is $5,000. Let's say you want to you want to drive business. You're going to discount to a golf now, or it's in your own marketing campaign, 20%. So if you discount at 20%, you're going to a $40 rate. That means, just so everyone's on the same page, to get to my $5,000 goal for the day, I've got to discount, or I've got to inc sorry, increase 25% more golfers, or 125 golfers. I can tell you, we've done the math on this literally a thousand times on the campaigns we've run and the days we've marketed. We, I'll say, almost <coughs> never increase. When we, to really move the needle, you've got to move at least 10, 15% if you're going to change any patterns of a customer. We've never, 20% will actually do it. We've never gotten a 25% increase in rounds. And so the scary part is, what we're doing is we're just shifting dollars around at a cheaper rate. And that's, the, that's in my opinion, the biggest cancer in our business right now, is people are doing this on a regular basis. Yes, sir. So earlier you were talking about the erosion of golfers and how we're losing business, and you pointed to it, and you said, we've got to get clubs in our hands That's a great point. First off, absolutely correct. The key is when you're when they're juniors is you have to entice them at that cheaper rate, hoping that once they become adults and they actually they finish college and make their own money, that they're actually going to come and they're going to pay the fifty dollars or forty dollars to come play your play your product. How's that been working for the last fifteen years? It's not easy. It's not easy, and it's I don't think it's going to get better. No. If you look at the stats, it's definitely not. The scary part with that going back to the stat page is. You've got the people that are just graduating college. They're not playing as much golf. And so the concern is, you said, I think you used the number 40 when they turn 40. When those people turn 40, are they going to be playing as much golf? We've already seen the trend is not, right? Just the social responsibilities of going to soccer games, baseball games, et cetera. We've had that in the last 15 years or more where the, the role of the uh, male adult in the family has changed a little bit what they're doing on Saturdays. They're not playing golf Saturdays, Sundays all the time. Yeah, just a bit. And that's going to continue to change. But also on a financial standpoint, one thing we're doing is we're creating programs. You know, we've got a couple of colleges near some of our properties. And we're doing a special just for them. Because I know when I was in college, if I would have to pay, go, pay to play golf, I would never play. So that's the other part. What are you doing with them when they're in college, just even post-college, when you're just trying to make ends meet, pay rent, et cetera, all those kind of things, until you get established in your, in your career. So it's a great point. You've got to keep it affordable, potentially keep it affordable to them to the point that they can do a career, and then hopefully they will continue. But we've got to start enticing those groups now, because there again, as we look the slide, most of the golfers are older, especially 55 plus, 65 plus was the only one that was growing, i.e. the boomers, as we talked about in the, in the past. So we've really got to still keep enticing them for free golf, well, low cost golf, hoping that then when they graduate college and get established that they will be paying the $50. And John, this is where the junior executive type more for a golf course itself and what we've experienced. We've learned that discounting, if you're looking at right about 19 people in, but just discounting. I, I believe also there's a price for, for every every golfer. For example, what, what I said before with JC, one of our uh, brands is that we're going to be something for everybody. We've got the Oak North Experience where you can go out for $25, you can go play ranch running for $85. So I, I also believe that it depends on where you are and what you can pay where you're going to play too. 
So I just know this is a typical course. This is an example of, for example, a, in our case, a Twin Oaks golf course, kind of middle of the road golf course. And we've learned that if we discount down, it just, we, we lose profitability. Not only are we are having rate erosion, which I'll get to in a second, but we're more importantly, we're not any more profitable. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, if you look at the statistics, I've been in Southern California since 1989, and about 1993 or 1994, when we didn't have enough tee times to fill the number of golfers that we had, um, our company made a pretty, and several companies made a pretty piss poor decision of eliminating, you know, the junior rank. And so, you know, I think we've done a fantastic job in the last, like, 10 years, you can see that in the SCPGA Junior. I mean, every single tournament fills up in two minutes. Um, I think we've done a great job as far as uh, creating clinics and, and stuff at the uh, you know soccer field and stuff like that and get golf clubs in people's hands, but we're not gonna see the end result of that for another you know 10 or 15 years probably. Right. So, I mean, but if you look at the stats, that's exactly when it happened. The, the, those, you know, all that happened back about 1993, 1994, when the junior rate ended. I mean, you know, guys, um, I mean, if dad's not gonna bring his, his son or daughter out to the golf course on a weekend, if it's gonna be $69 for that junior to play. If it's $20 for that kid to play along, then they're more likely to stay in the game at all. Absolutely, no question. Okay, uh, any other questions on that? John? Yes. Uh, when you talk to your owners about uh, their bottom line, what they, you know, you talk to one of the owners, finds about what the owner's paycheck is. Um, when it comes to discounting and, and that kind of thing, how often do you have to talk to your owner about having a smaller paycheck than he thinks you might have to have? Uh, you know, clearly a lot of the owners bought courses in 1995 for $15 million, and today mm -hmm. they're worth half that if they're lucky maybe. Um, but they've got a large mortgage that they've got to, to pay on that every month. How, how do you approach that discussion with, with your owners? And are you referring just to the discounting pricing or just well, in general? Just in general, yeah. Okay. Well, what I was doing. relative to, to now, that you have, now that we're in this phase of discounting and this, this has started. Right. Well, let me, let me tell you what I did for my owner, for example, on the discounting side. First off, we backed it up with stats. One thing I've learned is, and our owner is a very bright guy. and. If it has stats and numbers behind it, he's gonna understand it. So what we did is for all of our, whether it's a marketing campaign or when we did discount, we would try different discounts and we would track them very closely. And we'd bring analysis in and say, Mr. Owner, here you are, here's exactly why discounting doesn't work. The other thing I related to examples he might see. For example, I bought this, shirt, let's say this shirt was an $80 shirt and I got it on sale for $60, okay? So if I bought this and I bought it in yellow, Okay, and I bought it for, they're gonna sell for $60. Now I wanna get it white, I'm never gonna pay $80 for it. So I also try to relate examples to him that's real real life that he's gonna understand. This is why I can't discount this shirt to $60, I gotta keep it at 80. Because if I ever wanna get that price back up to 80, which I need to do to pay those bills, I'm never gonna get there. And I've used that example numerous times to him. But what we do is, on a quarterly basis at least, I try to discuss with them and, and talk to them about where we're gonna be. We talked about a little bit flash forecasts. No, not as much in this one, but does everyone know what a flash forecast is? Where you're gonna be at the end of the year? It's, it's, a, it's basically a part of the financial statement where you're guesstimating where you're gonna be in each month going through. And if I know we're gonna be behind at any certain point in time, I present that to him, at least quarterly, here's where we're gonna be at the end of the year, because I want him to know what his annual paycheck's gonna be before it gets there. Because all of a sudden, if he thinks he's gonna make 300 grand or let's say 200 grand or whatever on a golf course for the year, and it's only gonna be $50,000. I don't wanna tell him in December. I wanna tell him early enough that we have the reason behind it. I can tell you the rain, I'm tracking rain, precipitation, all that kind of stuff right now. We've had a really bad, in San Diego anyway, we've had a really bad start to our year versus prior year. We had a great start of the first quarter last year. This year is horrible. And all, all, the, all of our associates in the business are saying the exact same thing. So. Um, I come with stats like that. We're, I even send them precipitation sheets, all those kind of things. And one thing I've learned too is, I would highly recommend with your owners or your GMs or managers, whoever you report to, that you send it in an electronic form a lot. Even if I had a meeting with them, I went through it face to face is what I, the way I try to do it. I just send them a little recap that is an email. Because what I want to do when he has 
amnesia in December and forgets that, you know, why, why we're down so much and why, so they're making 200 grand this year, he's only gonna make 50 grand. I wanna, you know, remind him that we had these conversations about rain or tournaments or whatever it happens to be. So I highly recommend at least quarterly go through it. And if, even if you meet face to face, follow up with an email, just enjoyed our meeting. Here's some stats, here's, a, here's, a, here's some more stats on, on this or that, whatever it may, might happen to be. Does that answer the question, I hope? Quick question, what's your opinion on the field of public? Some people feel uh, shouldn't be any rack or set rate, it should be all dynamic based on days of the week or play. So rack or discounted variable inside, what's your opinion? We're, okay, JC Resorts, we're also in the hotel business. So the hotel business, for example, is 100% variable. You can call uh, Rancho Merwin this morning and it might be, the rate might be 259 I'm sorry, or 159, because we don't have anybody in the hotel. A group sells out the hotel for that week. Later tonight, it could be $259. Go up $100 in a room night, literally within an hour. On the golf list, I'm not convinced that that works. We've tried that a little bit, particularly with being the hotel side. We're always here, let's try to get the dynamic pricing model, I think is what you're referring to. I, I don't think it works because I think there's a limit what somebody's gonna pay on a Saturday morning. In a competition, is going to eventually discount down to a level that you're never going to be able to charge 100. Let's say your average rate on a weekend is $70. Just say your, your rack rate is 70. You can't charge 100 to offset the rate of $15 at 2 o'clock when no one's out there. I just don't think the model works for the entire marketplace. Plus, you're beholden to the guy who's the cheapest guy and who's lowering his price in the market. So the person who lowers the price in the market, you could be charging that, you could end up with no rack. I think the person just continually discounts could end up, they won't make any money and you won't make any money. And the problem is over time then, that could change your uh, value as to what your golf course, the perceived value of what, uh, what the round is golf, kind of like the shirt example. Yes. I think, I think you've got to have more fixed pricing than you do it based on time, whether it's a midday rate, essentially traditional. I hate doing things traditionally, but I think in this case, I think it's got to stay because the competition's so fierce and basically it takes just a couple people to really discount it down and you'll, you'll end up with nothing on the, on the tee sheet. It can be very dangerous. And I don't think there's enough, um, our point of sale systems and the way we look at our business is far behind, in my opinion, the hotel business. And I don't think there's enough uh, courses out there that are going to look at it that way, and I think uh, you could get left having a 20% loss in rounds in a year very easily by going by a dynamic price. Places have tried, I remember, my God, 15 years ago, I went to uh, Dallas, the, the group that does it all for the, uh, I think I'm forgetting right now, but does it for the timeshares and the airlines, and they were going to revolutionize golf. They were going to change the whole the whole way we looked at it. And it just, it never took off. And this has been, I know, 15 years. They had everybody in the room, Tuck and Troon, and you know, all the, all the big American golf, et cetera. It just never took off, and I don't think it will, just because I think um, everyone would have to get on board or it doesn't work. And I can tell you, in the hotel business, when it kind of went that way originally, it, it, it stumbled a little bit, too. They've all caught on now, but it stumbled a little bit, too, particularly when the hotels.com and they, those folks came on board. It took quite a few years before it all panned out. But I just think that people know exactly how much they want to pay for round of golf, and they're going to do it. I don't think they're going to ever pay 100. We'd have to all raise our rates, in my opinion, 25% higher on weekends, and I just don't think people are going to pay it. To the gentleman's point about um, the prices, what it, what it costs to, you know, for the fair to entry to play around the golf. Yes? Um, what's the difference then, um, you know, between They're, they're pretty close. They're pretty much the same thing. Right. Basically, your, your, your yield management or the utilization in the, in of a tee sheet, um, I think is what this gentleman is referring to is, basically, when you call in, if Saturdays are filling up, you might start today, it's only 70 bucks, but as your tee sheet's starting to fill up, all of a sudden, that thing can creep up to $120. I assume that's what you're referring to. So every, every moment, or essentially every new tee time, or every new call, or internet booking, they are changing the pricing model of your, of your tee sheet. And I think that's, I think it would be very challenging in our business. That's just, 
Okay, this is only definitely one person's opinion. I don't think, I think maybe in 10 or 15 years, possibly, when technology gets that much greater, and everybody can do it, and everybody's willing to do it, but it's also dangerous. What I, what I would look at, I'll give an example, with our JC Players Card program, we added, wanted to add value to it, so we, instead of giving a discount to Twilight Golf, we just we went and did it a half an hour early. So what we want to do is layer in our business where we, instead of having everybody compete for that, where Twilight, say Twilight starts at two o'clock, we want to give them from 1.30 to two. What I'm trying to do is fill it with our loyal customers first, that first half an hour before Twilight, and then Twilight, and if, let's say get an hour of Twilight. So I'm trying to fill that whole hour and a half if I can, rather than have the same people just compete for that hour worth of business when everybody wants to play when Twilight starts. So I really look at where you can fill key sheets at a rate certain time frames of the day um, was probably the best way to do it, which is a form of, you know, form of, uh, you, you know, to that point, more on utilization or yield management, not so much a dynamic pricing model, which I think is what you're asking, correct? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you. lucky to have people like John in our section who share their wisdom and, and uh, information with us. And, and John, just one more time, very, very grateful for the presentation this morning. Thank you very much. One of the things that you'll receive from the section here in the next day is an entire package of all of the information that you could not see on the screen today. And there's some very compelling stuff. So we're going to have that electronically sent to you. Uh, probably tomorrow morning, and I think you'll print it and enjoy all of the information that's contained there. Um, I think, personally, that these types of conversations, particularly about managing one's yield or the, the models that perhaps show a $50 green fee at 9 o'clock and at 9.45 at $62 are a dangerous precedent as well. And I think that one of these days we should have just a day to talk about those kinds of things and the way that uh, the erosion of pricing and, and some of the things that we've done to the customer is perhaps perceived as a bit of a disservice when uh, people are at your golf shop counter and they're all paying different rates. Uh, I, I think that it gets to be a little bit scary. Um, so with that, we're going to take a five minute break and move next door for a very exciting show with the great Don Parsons and Bill McKinney. And, um, and we'll do that now. Thanks very much.